Hello everyone, Professor Cornish here. Welcome to a presentation today on juveniles and adult sentencing. Now today we're gonna to be talking about juveniles whose cases have been transferred from the juvenile court to the adult criminal court. We're gonna be talking about case law pertaining to juveniles receiving sentences of death, sentences of life without the possibility to parole, as well as life with the possibility of parole. And we're going to talk about research that's been conducted on this topic. That ultimately the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, when they were making the decisions in the big cases that we're going to be talking about in this presentation, they utilized that research. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, before we really get into really the meat of this presentation, I do have a few definitions to review with you. Now, first, a juvenile is someone that is under the age of 18 at the time they committed their crime. So let's say you have someone that's 17 commit a murder two days before their 18th birthday and they're not arrested, gone to court, found guilty, and sentenced at, until after they've turned 18. It doesn't matter what age you were when you were arrested, what age you were when your trial took place, age you were when you were found guilty, age you were when you were sentenced, age you were when your punishment began. What matters is the age you were when you committed the crime. So when I refer to juvenile in this presentation, that's what I'm meaning is the defendant, the offender, the inmate was a juvenile at the time they committed their crime. We're also talking about criminal cases that were transferred from the juvenile court to the adult criminal court. And these cases, they involve serious crimes, older juveniles in most cases, and repeat offenders. These cases are normally transferred from the to the adult criminal court by means of various forms of waivers, whether it's judicial, meaning the judge makes the decision after either the defense or the prosecution has filed a motion to have the case transferred, the judge reviews everything and then they make the ultimate decision based on a set amount of criteria that they have to look at, um, statutory exclusion, which by statute, It'll state for juveniles, if you're this age and you committed this crime under these circumstances, your case is automatically waived to the adult criminal court. Or cases that involve concurrent jurisdiction, which is also known as prosecutorial waiver. Now, in concurrent jurisdiction, the prosecutor, and this is going to be set by statute, you know, by law that for these certain crimes, for juveniles that are this age, their cases can either be tried in the juvenile court or the adult criminal court. And the prosecutor, basically, they make the decision on which court to file it in. Now, Nebraska and Wyoming they have set criteria that the prosecutor has to look at when determining whether they will file it in the juvenile court or the adult criminal court. So just again, as a reminder, we're talking about juveniles who were juveniles at the time they committed their crimes. And we're talking about cases that were transferred to the adult criminal court. Now, first, we're going to be discussing juveniles and the death penalty, because really the case law related to the death penalty, especially the final death penalty case we're going to be talking about, really set the standard 
for the other big cases we're going to be talking about. Now, the first case that addressed juveniles and the death penalty is Eddings v. Oklahoma. Now, this is a 1982 case. Now, this is the first case heard by the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, addressing a juvenile's age at the time they committed their crime. Now, SCOTUS, when they heard the case, they actually vacated the sentence on the grounds that the trial court failed to consider the defendant's age as a mitigating circumstance. So this is a pretty big decision. And at this point, we're in the middle of get tough on crime. Where we took a hard stance on crime, severe punishments. So for get tough on crime, this is actually a pretty big decision. You know, SCOTUS saying, hey, trial courts, you've got to look at the defendant's age as a mitigating circumstance if they were a juvenile when they committed their crime. Now, Eddings, SCOTUS did not address really the constitutionality of sentencing juveniles to death. But it did hold that chronological age at the time of the crime was a relevant mitigating factor that the trial court needed to consider when determining what sentence is appropriate in the case. Now, between 1983 and 1986, SCOTUS rejected five requests to examine the constitutionality of ex executing juvenile offenders. Now, again, 1983, 1986, we are in the heart of get tough on crime. So it's very understandable for that time period that SCOTUS would reject any writs of centuri which writs of centuri are requests for SCOTUS to hear a case. Now, Thompson v. Oklahoma, 1988. So we are still in Get Tough on Crime. Now, in this case, it involved an offender that was 15 at the time the crime was committed. Now, at a five to three decision, SCOTUS vacated the sentence in the case. Now, Justices Stephen, Brennan, Marshall, and Blackman stated that the execution of a 15-year-old was cruel and unusual punishment due to it being inconsistent with current standards of decency at the time. And also, it failed to contribute to the purposes of capital punishment, two of which are deterrence and retribution. Now, in a previous presentation, I actually discussed the goals of punishment and the standards of decency. You know, what the courts look at when they determine is a punishment excessive? Is it cruel and unusual? So make sure to watch that presentation. Now, with Thompson, Justice O'Connor agreed but stated that Oklahoma's capital punishment statute, it didn't have a minimum age in which the penalty could actually be imposed. Now, in Thompson, SCOTUS ruled that capital punishment was unconstitutional in cases in which the defender was under the age of 16 at the time the offense was committed, unless the state had a minimum age limit in its statute. So basically, it stated if somebody's under 16, you can't ex execute them. And Thompson also stated, states, you just can't have a blanket death penalty policy. You have to, ha if you are going to apply it to juveniles, you have to have a minimum age set. And that minimum age, as a result of this ruling, was 16. Now, at the time of Thompson, it was assumed that juveniles that were 16 and 17 basically because they were close to 18, they were nearly legal adults, that they were similar to adults. And therefore, 
they're more responsible, more culpable of their crimes than what someone who's 15 and younger is. We now know through research that I'll be discussing later that that's not the case. Now, Stanford v. Kentucky, 1989 case, it was the consolidation of two cases addressing the constitutionality of sentencing a 16 and a 17-year-old to death. Um, Stanford and then Wilkins v. Kentucky. Now, oftentimes, SCOTUS, if they have two or more cases come up, relatively close period of time <laughs> excuse me and they actually agree to hear them they'll go ahead and put them together if they're on very similar topics because why just address one case and not the other or we're going to hear one and then okay now we're going to have to hear this one which was on pretty much the same topic it's a, basically it's a time saver you know, these are similar cases. We're probably going to rule the same in this case that we will in this one, that we will in this one. So let's just group it together. Now, in Stanford, SCOTUS did not examine the third consideration when determining if a punishment is possibly cruel and unusual. The proportionality of the punishment to the offense and whether the punishment contributed to the purposes of deterrence and retribution. So they didn't consider that. What they focused on was determining if executing a 16 and a 17 year old was considered a violation of the then current standards of decency. You know, is this considered excessive? Is this considered cruel and unusual? You know, we as a society, do we feel this is barbaric? That's what they addressed. And at the time, 1989, we were on get tough on crime. Hard stance on crime. Severe punishments. With get tough on crime, the goals of punishment that received the main focus were deterrence. We're going to make the punishment so severe that you're going to have the pants scared off of you and you're not going to want to commit crime. Incapacitation, basically removing you from society so you can't commit crime and retribution. You committed a harm against society. Therefore, we're going to harm you through punishment. Those were the goals that we're focused on. As well as during this time period, juvenile crime was increasing and it was getting more severe. And we had what was called a juvenile super predator. Because during that, that time, there was a significant increase in juveniles committing violent crime. And the public, because it's got a lot of media attention, the public was fearful of these juvenile super predators. So they were supportive of, hey, we got to stop these kids. We got to make sure they're not running the streets and murdering people. So really, that's kind of why SCOTUS made the decision they did with this. And some of the other decisions. Now, at the time of Stanford, 22 of the 37 states utilizing capital punishment allowed it to be utilized for ones that were 16. And 25 allowed it for 17. So we still had a lot of states that were using execution for juveniles. So it wasn't going against then standards of decency. It wasn't considered excessive, cruel, and unusual, barbaric. We were in the middle of get tough on crime, and there was that fear of that juvenile super predator. So therefore, it wasn't going against 
what society felt was okay at the time. Now, in the states that set a minimum age in which capital punishment could be utilized, 16 was a minimum age. Now, granted, that's going back with Thompson. Now, SCOTUS ruled in the light of the legislative lay of the land and the ruling in Thompson, capital punishment was not deemed immoral by societal consensus. Now, in Thompson, again, they said, if you're 15 and younger, execution was unconstitutional. 16 and 17, you're pretty much an adult. So Stanford was keeping with not only SCOTUS's previous ruling, but also really what society felt was okay at the time. Now, the big case pertaining to juveniles and the death penalty, Roper v. Simmons, 2005 case. So this is 16 years after Stanford. We started going out of get tough on crime in the mid 90s. Now, it's been a very slow transition and actually we're still addressing many of the issues that were caused by Get Tough on Crime. But 1995, you know, around the mid 90s, up through the 2000s, and even to now, we were starting to realize that just focusing on deterrence, retribution, incapacitation wasn't effective. And that we needed also to focus on rehabilitation and reintegration. Now with Roper, SCOTUS ruled it is unconstitutional to execute individuals that were juveniles at the time they committed their crimes. 17 and younger, unconstitutional. So Roper took the execution of anyone under the age of 18 completely off the table. It is unconstitutional. Now, since Stanford, 16 years, the legislative lay of the land significantly changed. And a lot of it was due to we were moving away from get tough on crime. There was a lot more research that, were, that was going on. And states changed things as a result of that. 30 states had now prohibited the execution of all juveniles. And the few that still had it on the books, it was used really infrequently. Some weren't even using it at all. And also the public was not as fearful of juvenile offenders as they were at the time of Stanford. You know, juvenile violent crime had been steadily decreasing since 1994. And because of that public fear and really that demand to give juveniles those harsh punishments had gone down significantly. So as a result, you had states, they changed their laws. It's like, hey, the public doesn't want this anymore. And you'll find that legislatures, because their ultimate boss is the public. You know, the public elects them into office. They have to listen to the public. And so if public sentiment changes, they should be changing their sentiment as well. Does it always happen? No. But should it? Yes, because they are a representative of the public. Now, SCOTUS and Roper, they raised significant concern regarding really the culpability of juveniles. Are they actually responsible for committing their crime? Now, Really beginning around the mid 90s, an evaluation of sentencing programs and interventions created really an enlightenment that retribution and deterrence were not adequate justifications for executing an individual that was a juvenile at the time they committed their crime. 
And also we had a lot of research in neuroscience and human development found that the human brain, specifically the prefrontal cortex, does not fully mature until around age 25. Now the prefrontal cortex, it's in the frontal lobe. So the part of the brain that's behind your forehead, the prefrontal cortex is really in charge of some big ticket stuff. You know, some very high order brain functions such as planning and organization, utilizing knowledge to regulate behavior, engagement and rational thought, ability to control impulses, to regulate emotions and future thinking. Now the prefrontal cortex, it's in charge of rational thought, you know, thinking before you're acting, kind of weighing the pros and the cons of the situation. You know, hey, am I gonna get in trouble? Am I not? Can I hurt myself? Can I hurt somebody else? Impulse control, you know, you actually thinking before acting instead of just acting on impulse, regulating emotions, as well as future thinking, which future thinking, it's not focusing on the here and now, but okay, if I do this, how could it affect me a month from now? Six months, a year, five years, 10 years. With juveniles, they are very focused on the here and now. You know, how is this going to be good for me right now? How this is, is this going to benefit me? Is this going to benefit my buddies? Most juveniles aren't thinking about how could this decision affect me five years down the road? And even think back to when you were a teen. And some of the decisions you made, you probably look back on some of those going, oh my gosh, I was so dumb. I can't believe I did that. And you probably wouldn't make the same decisions now as an adult. That's because the older you get, the more your prefrontal cortex develops. And with that, you gain more rational thought, more ability to control your impulses, more ability to regulate your emotions, more ability to engage in that future thinking. So really, the research showed juveniles aren't just like adults. Even if they're 16 and 17, they're not just like adults. They are different. Now, as I stated previously, juveniles really don't have a strong ability to conduct what's called a cost benefit analysis. You know, weighing the pros and the cons of an action. And that's because they focus on the immediate benefits. They're really not able to control impulses very well. They lack that future thinking. And really, they're really not focusing on those long-term consequences. They're also less able to apply reason in real life situations, more easily influenced by the peer group. You know, for those of you listening that are adults, think of how much like your family and your friends influenced you as a kid. And think of, do they actually influence you that much now, especially your peers, not so much probably. Juveniles also lack that future orientation. They're poor risk assessors. They focus on positive and not negative consequences. And of course, less able to control impulses. Now also research in juvenile delinquency showed that juveniles mostly commit crimes in groups. Your average kid Granted, they'll do stupid things on their own, but they're more likely to commit delinquent acts when they're in a group, especially when they don't have anything constructive to do when they're unsupervised. They're motivated by immediate rewards, and also their crime is 
often based on opportunity in the behavior of the group. Also, juveniles, they found that they're more vulnerable to negative influences and outside pressures. And really that's because when you're a child, when you're a teen, you don't have that life experience. You don't have that wisdom. You don't have a strong sense of self. You don't know who you are yet. You're still trying to figure it out. And as you start gaining those, then that influence goes down. Think of a concrete sidewalk. You know, a juvenile, they can be easily molded like a sidewalk that was just poured. And that's because not only is their prefrontal cortex not fully developed yet, but also they don't have that life experience. They don't have that strong sense of self. So they're easily molded. They're easily influenced like a pile of clay or adults. Once they start having that maturity, that life experience, their brains fully matured, they know who they are, that influence goes down. Now, SCOTUS and Roper viewed that the criminal behavior of juvenile can't be considered as immorally reprehensible as that an adult. And therefore, they said, hey, the death penalty, it can't be used on juveniles. They are not the same as an adult. So really, Roper created a categorical exemption for juveniles. Stated, if you're under the age of 18 and you commit a crap capital crime, you cannot be put to death, period. Now, as a result of Roper, states either had to resentence the juveniles they had on their death row or commute their sentences to life without the possibility of parole. Really, they had the decision on which way to go with that. I would state most of them probably went to either life without the possibility of parole, life without, or even life with the possibility of parole, because it's a heck of a lot cheaper than having to go through resentencing. And now that really Roper laid the groundwork for the next set of cases that we're going to be discussing, especially the big ones. But now we're going to talk about juveniles and the sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Now, the first case we're going to discuss is Graham v. Florida, which 2010 case. Now, the big cases we're going to be talking about SCOTUS's decision in Roper and the research it used in making its decision, it's the groundwork for these cases. Now, in Graham 2010 case, SCOTUS addressed the constitutionality of using a sentence of life without the possibility of parole, life without, in cases where, again, the defendant was a juvenile at the time the crime was committed. Now, Graham only addressed non-homicide cases. So juveniles committing a case that did not involve murder. So we're talking about every other felony but murder. Now, with Graham, SCOTUS ruled that a sense of life without in a non-homicide case violated the Eighth Amendment's cruel and unusual punishment clause. Now, SCOTUS felt that juveniles committing crimes that did not involve murder, they needed to have the opportunity to obtain release at some point based on their maturity and rehabilitation. Now, most juveniles do age out of criminality. And a lot of it's because their prefrontal cortex matures. They gain more maturity, more wisdom, more life experience. Their sense of self becomes stronger. Now, 
Now, just reviewing some of the information we haven't discussed so far. Juveniles, SCOTUS felt were more vulnerable to negative influences and outside pressures to include that of family and friends. Now, juveniles, they have less control than adults to be able to control their environment and get themselves out of like crime producing settings like dysfunctional families, gangs, uh, bad schools, disorganized neighborhoods, etc. So if a juvenile's in a bad situation, they've got family members that are committing crimes, they've got gangs around them, you know, just everything's really bad in that environment. They really don't have the ability to pick up and leave. Or an adult can. Now, based on the research in neuroscience, human development, and juvenile criminality, and again, the research in Roper served as a foundation that additional research was laid on for this. That a SCOTUS felt a juvenile's character is not as well formed as an adult's, and that their traits are less fixed as an adult, making rehabilitation more likely. Now, think about let's go back to the clay example. A juvenile would be like a wet piece of clay. You can mold it to whatever you want. And let's say you mess up. Like you're throwing a plate and you mess up the plate. As long as that clay is still wet, you can remold it. That's like a juvenile. Because their sense of self isn't concrete yet. They can be reformed and reshaped. Where an adult, let's say you messed up throwing a plate and you decide to not fix it until the clay's dry. You're not going to be able to fix it. Now, if it's damp-ish, you can, but it's going to take a lot more work. That's like an adult. You can rehabilitate an adult. It's just harder because their sense of self is now formed. And their criminality and everything else, it's habit. So now you have to go in and break those habits and reteach them. Where with a juvenile... They're less able, they're more able to change. Now, with Roper, as we discussed earlier, it was keeping with societal consensus. You know, we had so many states had un, had taken the death penalty for juveniles completely off the books. The few that had it didn't use it. So with SCOTUS's decision with Roper, it was keeping with what society was already doing and wanting. Graham went against that. At the time of Graham, 39 states allowed juveniles to receive a sentence of life without in non-murder crimes. 39. So it was going against societal consensus. SCOTUS based its decision solely on the research it utilized in Roper, as well as additional research that they reviewed specific to this case. Now, with Graham, and this is going to be an issue, a big issue in a later case we're going to discuss. SCOTUS did not specifically state the ruling was retroactive, meaning it applied to past cases but the federal circuit courts of appeals and the states they assumed as such hey this is a big decision we're going to apply it to previous cases there wasn't an issue so with Graham it took life without off the table for juveniles that committed any other felony but murder. At the time of Graham, life without was still on the table for murder cases. 
Now, the next case we're going to talk about is Miller v. Alabama, which 2012 case. And again, this addressed the use of life without for juveniles. Now, this case specifically applies to homicide cases where the mandatory sentence is life without. Now, with a mandatory sentence in the criminal statute, the criminal law, it'll state if you commit this crime, you get this sentence, period. The judge doesn't have any discretion in the case. They can't examine the case and look at the mitigating circumstances, what lessens the severity, aggravating circumstances, which makes it more severe. The judge can't look at any of those. They can't look at the case to determine what sentence will actually be appropriate. With a mandatory sentence, the statute states this is the sentence you're going to get for this crime, period. And the judge just has to go, okay, and they hand it down. Now, Miller was a consolidation of two cases. Miller v. Alabama, which involved murder, and Jackson v. Hobbs, which Arizona case that involved felony murder. Uh, felony murder is where a murder results when a felony is being committed. Now, both cases involved juveniles whose cases were transferred to the adult criminal court and they received a sentence of life without per statute due to statutory mandate. So in Alabama and Arkansas, they had the mandatory sentence if you commit murder you're getting life without, period. And in those cases, the judge goes, well, life without, bang. They have no discretion with, with a mandatory sentence. Now, SCOTUS ruled in Miller that a mandatory sentence of life without for juveniles was unconstitutional due to it being disproportionate and cruel and unusual, both being violations of the Eighth Amendment. Now, the ruling, there's a lot of confusion with Miller because some people think that it automatically took life without the table for juveniles that commit murder. That's not the case. What Miller did was it stated, hey, if you have a juvenile that commits murder in a state where for murder, you get a mandatory sentence of life without, that's what's taken off the table. What Miller stated was, okay, in states where there is for murder, the mandatory sentence of life without, when a juvenile is at trial, judge has to have discretion in sentencing. It can't be that mandatory sentence. The judge has to be able to look at the case and determine the appropriate sentence. So what Miller did was it stated that for juveniles that commit murder, and this is going beyond even just taking mandatory life without off the table. What, what Miller stated was, okay, if the trial court for a juvenile that commits murder, if life without the possibility of parole is a potential sentence, meaning for juveniles, it's still, it's on the books. What Miller said is the trial court has to before handing down a sentence of life without they've got the set criteria that they have to look at so really miller what it did was one mandatory sentences of life without murder cases it said for juveniles trial judges 
have to have discretion in determining the appropriate sentence. This can't be an life without can't be an automatic sentence. But it also set forth criteria that if life without is a possibility, the trial judges have to look at. And we'll discuss that criteria. Now with Miller, and this is actually nicknamed the Miller Matrix, the trial courts have to, one, look at the defendant's age and maturity level. They also have to examine the family and home environment, the impact of pressure and influence from friends, family, and other significant individuals on the juvenile. The extent the juvenile was involved in the crime. You know, were they just the getaway driver or did they actually shoot the gun? And then they also have to look at what's the likelihood of the juvenile rehabilitating. Now, once all of these factors are examined, the judge then, if they feel life without is appropriate, they can hand that down as a sentence. Now, again, just for clarification, Miller only applies to defendants that were juveniles. Mandatory sentences of life without for adults is still constitutional. And Miller, again, because I want to clarify this because it, it always ends up getting mixed up. Miller took mandatory life without off the table for juveniles and murder cases. What it did was state, hey, trial judges, you've got all this criteria you have to look at. And once you examine it, if you feel life without is an appropriate sentence, you can hand it down at that point. But you have to have the discretion. That's that's what Miller did. Now, again, juveniles are not categorically exempt from receiving a sentence of life without. But SCOTUS did feel that life without would only be limited to the most severe cases. That's a lot of the reason why they didn't completely take life without off the table. They wanted to have the trial judges have the discretion in determining if life without was appropriate sentence. And they felt that, hey, this sentence isn't going to get used very often. So we still want, if there is a severe case, <laughs> we still want this to be a possible sentence. Now, Miller, just like Graham, went against societal consensus. 2012, there were 28 states that used mandatory sentences of life without for juveniles that were tried and convicted as adults. Just like with Graham, SCOTUS based what it felt were the current standards of decency solely on the research. Now, just like Graham, SCOTUS did not make the ruling retroactive, meaning it applied to previous cases. Now, they felt that with, like, you know, with Graham, the, feder the federal circuits and the states, they went ahead and applied it to past cases without an issue. So they felt that, oh, hey, Miller will go the same way. They were significantly wrong. There, with Miller, there was a great disagreement amongst the federal circuit courts and the states regarding if Miller should be applied to previous cases and if there was the need for resentencing. The second, third, fourth, and eighth Federal Courts of Appeals ruled petitioners can move forward with resentencing claims. The 5th and 11th denied such claims. Of the then 28 states with mandatory life without on the books for juveniles, only 13 restructured their statutes to comply with Miller. In 2014, only 
four of the states that amended their statutes actually allowed for resentencing. So of the 13 that actually restructured their statutes, only four of those allowed for resentencing. The other nine went, oh, well, yeah, we'll apply it to previous cases, but um, past cases, good luck getting resentenced because it's not going to happen. Now, there were major issues regarding the retroactivity pretty much right out of the gate from miller scotus received two writs of centuri regarding retroactivity and they denied it the reason why was it was pretty close to after the ruling and miller got handed down and they felt okay we're gonna give the federal circuits and the state's time to actually figure things out hopefully we'll do what they want them to we want them to even though we didn't say it we hope but reality that wasn't the issue there was still a huge issue multiple writs were coming up and scotus was fine like you know we better address this because we felt everybody was going to assume like they did with Graham and they didn't. And this is a whole ton of issue. We're going to have to tell them that this does apply to past cases and what they need to do regarding resentencing. That's what they did with Montgomery v. Louisiana. 2016 case this is what i nicknamed the miller fix this is basically scotus scolding the federal circuits in the states hardcore now in their ruling in montgomery scotus stated all existing mandatory life without sentences involving juveniles were nullified so they said okay for those of you that did not apply Miller to past cases, for those of you that didn't resentence, those sentences are gone. And SCOTUS told the states, and they also told the federal circuits, and you guys better make sure this happens too. The states either had to grant parole hearings to all the juveniles receiving a mandatory sentence of life without, or they had to resentence them and apply the Miller standard. I would imagine most states did parole hearings because that's actually going to be a lot cheaper than the resentencing. So basically, just think of with Montgomery, that's the scolding from Miller. Basically, Scott is saying, you know, we messed up. We thought you guys would apply to past cases. We were wrong in assuming you would. So now this is us saying you better apply it to past cases and you better resentence or else. Kind of like road trip with the parents kids are being naughty in the back seat and the parent turns around and says don't make me turn this car around that's basically montgomery and now we're going to look at the current status of juvenile life without jones v mississippi this is a 2021 case it addressed the constitutionality of discretionary life without sentences for juveniles Miller and Montgomery just addressed mandatory. Jones is looking at discretionary, meaning the trial judges have the discretion on handing down life without if they feel it's appropriate. SCOTUS ruled in Jones that trial court judges are not required to find juveniles permanently incorrigible 
meaning they are majorly bad. There is no fixing them. They're not going to rehabilitate when deciding if life without is appropriate. So um, that's basically what what happened with with Jones. Discretionary life without is still on the table for juveniles, but it clarified that hey, these they can't be beyond rehabilitation. You know that's just what you know they're ability to be rehabilitated that's just one of the criteria we're looking at with the miller matrix now since 2012 32 states in the district of columbia amended their statutes regarding life without for juveniles and murder cases either by completely banning them or re the sentence or limiting it now actually that number has gone up um now, when I made this presentation, which was last, which was either last year or the year before, so it's either the tail end of 2021 or in 2022. At that time, 20 states in the District of Columbia completely did away with life without for juveniles. It is now up to, and this is as of August 2023. 29 states and the District of Columbia. We had three more states added this year. So since I made this presentation, nine more states got added. So this is a really hot button issue right now. You know, states looking at juveniles receiving life without. There's even states that are looking at juveniles receiving life with the possibility of parole sentences. So this is, you know, a very current issue that's constantly evolving and possibly a month from now, we may have more, more states that took life without completely off the table for juveniles. Who knows? So I hope all of you enjoyed the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to contact me. Stay safe out there. Have a great day.